In this video, I put the Snapmaker Artisan to the test with a 400 hour print of the loudest, best sounding desktop speaker I have yet featured on the channel. Straight away, a bit of housekeeping. And no, I'm not asking you to smash any buttons or ring any bells. This is about my presentation table. It's a new year, and given the size of the machines already on the review roster, this simply isn't going to cut it. So, as a matter of sheer necessity, today's unboxing begins with some woodworking. In fact, before I even introduce the artisan, I should call attention to the fact that fully assembled with the enclosure, it has a footprint of, near as makes no difference, a square meter. So if I could just have that kind of surface right at bench level, that would be great. And here it is four half meter square stands that I can arrange as needed from extending the workbench to supporting something the size of the Artisan or even the Orange Storm Giga. Why not? The machine comes packaged in two separate boxes, the larger of which contains everything needed to assemble the Artisan as a 3D printer and that's what I'll focus on in this video. Here we find some of these new and improved linear modules, and a brain box oddly reminiscent of the JL Audio H0112 wedge. Yeah! Once assembled, the machine undergoes a series of calibrations, and in no time at all, a 3D Benchy is all set to print, though perhaps with less than ideal adhesion. Better try it again with a brim. And it looks like the machine had lost its bearing on the Z-axis because that's a pretty sh Benchy. Well, whatever, I'll just chalk this up to the firmware update clearing up my coordinates because after a second series of calibrations, the results more than made up for the pile of pubes and once the extruder lifted away, I was rather satisfied with the results, which also prompts me to offer a proper introduction. This is the Snapmaker Artisan, with an integrated controller boasting a 7-inch touchscreen and a working area of no less than 400 by 400 millimeters with another 400 millimeters in height. All the kinematics are courtesy of these industrial grade linear rails and while configured as a 3D printer, the machine comes with a dual extruder hotend which I will now put through some rigor. So let us segue over to the inspiration for the feature build. Here, Meze was kind enough to send me the 109 Pros as a palette cleanser from all the planars. This is their first attempt at a dynamic open back with an in-house developed 50mm dual composite driver and you can probably watch 20 minutes of Zeos talk about how inoffensive they sound. To me, they seemed a little lean in the sub bass and somewhat defiant of the SP correction that is until after an extended break-in period after which they just made everything sound pleasant and well balanced. So that is exactly what I've worked up here. Something that'll out pleasant all but a few of the top tier desktop dwelling speakers with just under $100 worth of Dayton audio components and plenty of ways to torture test a dual extruder machine. This is Dozer, the coolest 3D printable toy desktop speaker currently in existence. I don't actually know that for a fact, probably just starting some in the comments. Anyway, I designed it such that no standing waves can form inside the chamber, both drivers aim 15 degrees upward, positioning the vertical lobe at the listener's ear. They are also both horn assisted for improved coupling along the upper frequencies and for minimal diffraction with the outer curvature, keeping the pressure waves intact as they expand across the surface toward the back of the enclosure. The reflex stage is tuned for a solid extension down to 40 Hz, giving listeners the option to apply some bass boost and hear actual room filling bass without the wave get chuffing for lack of a proper air load or its laminar passage in and out of the chamber. Alternately, a flat signal can be applied from 40 Hz up, leaving the speakers to rely on just the passive crossovers and the natural tone that I've shaped acoustically for just about the loudest and most pleasantly balanced 40 Hz to 20 kHz presentation of any desktop speaker. Finally, I made the outer features two-tone just to give both extruders something to do, and later on I may also try some water solubles on the back plate. So, one more series of calibrations before the long haul, and here's the Artisan setting off on a week-long print starting with a brim for everything including the prime tower. Here's a bit of the first layer with the support grid work. Here we are several layers in, and for anyone interested, the model was sliced in Luban using the precise and strong profile on both extruders, giving us a 0.16mm layer height, 3 perimeter walls, and a 25% cubic infill. Ideally, I would have nudged this up to 40% or even higher, but at 100mm per second print speed, this could very well have taken longer than the heavy model would have ever held onto the build plate. 
especially on a bed slinger. Anyway, before I go off to do something else, I'd better put a fresh spool of orange on here, and the most convenient way to do that is to simply cause a deliberate filament runout, which prompts a little pit stop for you to advance the extruder and then it's right back on task. Further up, I get to show you how the nozzles change over, so here we are finishing up the orange, the hot end travels over to the prime tower, the orange retracts, the black is primed, goes out there, does all the accent panels, and then it's right back over to the prime tower where the orange re-emerges for the next bit. That's pretty much the routine going forward, bearing in mind of course that in this orientation the print increases in area as it grows taller so each new layer takes a little longer to finish. That being said, nothing particularly interesting happened for another 30 or so hours, at which point the prime tower decided to release from the build plate, leaving the extruders to purge mid-air. This isn't the end of the world, in fact it's not even a reason to pause the print, I'll just end up with these bristles everywhere and most of them release on their own, collecting at the bottom of the print like needles on their Christmas tree. There's also a minor bit of lifting around the corners, which I would like to avoid for next time, and given that the artisan comes with an enclosure, this will be the perfect opportunity to see whether or not using it makes a difference. So, even as Dozer 1 is still being jostled back and forth on the build plate, I thought I'd get into the other box. And here's where we find all the pieces to build the enclosure, the laser engraving platform, the CNC platform, and their respective tool heads including this 200W spindle and this 10W laser module. Yet, I don't think that either of these attachments can illustrate the machine's accuracy quite like the extruder which, despite the loss of the prime tower, continues, seemingly unaffected, layer after layer, spool after spool doing astonishingly solid job bringing Dozer into being and the fine layer height renders all the soft curvature with a glossy finish. So, 174 hours of this and I'm halfway to a set. By the way, unlike the Prime Tower, this thing really held on, which I find reassuring because I'm about to do it again, this time with the machine enclosed. There's a bit of cable management, the filament holders are resituated out here, with a couple of Bowden tubes running down to the extruders. And once the nozzles are primed, I run another bed leveling routine before Dozer 2 sets out to be made, this time with the footprint kept completely within the inner 260 by 260 mm high temperature perimeter of this dual zone heat bed. I've also assigned the supports to the left extruder for a more balanced use of the two available spools. Finally, I doubled the radius of the prime tower and moved it to the middle of the print so that, even if it fails, the bristles will catch on the supports rather than any exterior perimeter. So, while that's happening, I'll dispense with the borderline satisfying chore of getting all these supports out. And there's plenty of them, enough to fill a bin, though the most impressive chunk of all is this interface layer. This is what held Dozer's face up from beneath and it is smooth. More to the point, so is its inverse, which matters especially as I modeled these inset for a tight clearance just like the press fit color on the backpack speaker in a prior video. So here's one of the ND25FA-4s, catchy name by the way, and it fits like a glove, in fact so does the TCP115-4. Honestly, for this type of critical geometry to print this well entirely over supports, I have to give the artisan some well-deserved praise. What's more, Dozer 2 is shaping up to be even better over there in its toasty orange shelter. And it is toasty, I can assure you, even with just the build plate pulling double duty as a space heater. Nevertheless, I am not seeing any lifting anywhere, so yes, the enclosure does in fact make a difference. This should come as no surprise to anyone, yet still something that I got to A-B test on camera. Further onward, a loud scraping noise of the right extruder, still extended with the left one in use, brought the print to a screeching halt. The temperature readout showed a staggering 550 degrees with no response from the temperature menu, no option to retract the nozzle, and an error code 217 preventing the print job from continuing. So, the machine is not without its quirks, some of which may set you back 50 or 60 hours and a few spools of filament. Still, the only way that I'll end up with a pair of these is if I can manage to print the second one. So, let me just rerun the calibration and cross my fingers for another 170 hours of nothing f***ing up. We should probably cross dicks too. The next 48 of those hours flew by without incident until the prime tower had once again toppled over, though this time with the purge material confined to the inner support structure. This appears to have worked well enough for a 274mm tall print with a hull conveniently going through the middle of it, but the gantry also travels up to 400mm and I'm a bit skeptical as to whether or not a prime tower of that height would ever survive. 
Nevertheless, here we are about 60 hours into the print and it looks like we made it past whatever glitch foiled the prior attempt. What's more, even as the purge material forms a little rat's nest inside the clearing, the print quality doesn't appear at all affected and the two-tone model inches further toward completion. Here we are on the final stretch and there's Dozer 2 crossing the finish line at a new record time of 166 hours and 55 minutes. Still a week-long print, but it's also a far greater badge of accomplishment than a 45-minute Benji. Up next, the right extruder will go from orange to this water-soluble PVA from eSun. And to print the complex geometry of the waveguide, supports will be needed in difficult-to-reach places. The machine is once again calibrated, and it looks like the print will take around 36 hours. Right away, I scaled the prime tower up to 300%, so let's see if that holds. I also modified the slicing profile with 8 perimeter walls to ensure that the waveguides print entirely solid. Here's the first couple of layers with the polyvinyl stringing like nobody's business. And not even 100 layers into the job, the prime tower had once again led me to wonder why Snapmaker hadn't implemented some kind of a purge shoot solution instead of whatever's happening here. Granted, this is likely a problem with the PVA, not with the machine because the PLA portion of the print is still bang on. So let's try it again with the right extruder dialed down to 190 degrees and white brims for the PVA to hopefully stick to better than the build plate. This turned out to be very hit and miss and while the lower nozzle temperature helped with the stringing a little bit, it also reduced the adhesion to a point where certain support features wouldn't even form. Whatever, we can play this on hard mode. Here's a fresh spool of black for the left extruder. The polyvinyl is ditched for the spool of orange from earlier. And yeah, I'm doing this with PLA supports. Realizing of course that at this point I could have simply used a single extruder, but in the interest of presentation, with the two colors we can easily distinguish the model from all the generated supports. And it appears to be working. In fact, with the estimated print time well under 48 hours, the prime tower actually stands a chance of surviving. Here we are nearing the finish, and all is well. To its credit, the artisan does an excellent job with the interface layers, so getting all these supports to release shouldn't be a total nightmare. And 37 hours later, I get to test that assertion with ample relief as everything detaches quite easily, including all the internal supports around the band. This just leaves the electronics, so here's some customary footage of me soldering away. These components aren't coming back out, so there's no reason to put spade connectors at both ends. The crossovers are padded with some blue tack and seated on mounting risers. This is where an angle driver comes in handy, and once I finish screwing, Sophie appeared to line the outer edges of the speaker insets with a carefully applied layer of JB Weld. It's worth bearing in mind that even a small air leak under the enclosure's high operating pressure will manifest as a very annoying, scratchy, hissing noise. Which is also why I didn't bother with screws for any of the components, instead just hermetically welding everything in. This was followed by a 16-hour curing period, at the end of which the components were finally plugged into the crossovers, and the compression chambers were sealed shut with some blue tech around the perimeter. Here's 8 screws worth of clamping action, and once I have them both sealed up, it's on to the RTA. The near field sweep correlates well with the prediction, except for this hump around 60Hz, which thankfully goes away as the speakers come forward. Anyway, before I crank these up, in the interest of safety, I'll splice in a mini DSP 2x4. And all that I'm doing here is cutting off everything below 40Hz. So now for Sophie's first impression, hearing these add volume. is a good takeaway, but now let's see what these are capable of in a larger space. That being said, here's some footage of us talking under the music, once again at volume, this time with a bass shelf elevated for equal loudness at the listening position. Ah, where do we begin? Everybody really likes the last one on the list. Yeah, but the last one on the list has a 33 hertz bass line, know, and these I'm speakers cut up at 40 hertz. In fact, so does the uh, little mini DSP there. Oh, we can try it. Actually, you should be 
just sitting and listening to music if I want to listen to music in here while you're in the studio I'd rather listen to these mm -hmm. but that's just I, I love these headphones anyways but comparatively speaking I'm still gonna say that I like these are just these because, close in what they do you know I might actually say that they are quite on par good a fitting conclusion to a fun demo so let's sum it all up the Ordison is a beast. I literally had to make some more furniture just to unbox it. Ironically, there's the Snapmaker 2.0 already commanding half of my other workbench, so if I'm going to bring something even bigger out here to see and see and laser with, that'll be a project for another time. Meanwhile, as a 3D printer, the Artisan is nearly beyond reproach. I don't like the Prime Tower solution or the occasional mid-print glitch, otherwise it is an excellent 3-axis platform with a capable dual extruder and a passively heated enclosure does, in fact, help keep the edges of prints from lifting. So, many thanks to Snapmaker for the two giant boxes of fun and also to Meze for this nice shiny one. That is a wrap, and as always I look forward to your two cents on the demo as well as the gear that you're listening on. Don't forget to rate the video as you see fit, subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers! <laughs>